Colin Powell recently passed away and many on the left were frustrated that there were expressions of condolences from progressives despite his status as a war criminal. Can you explain the choice to say something when you could have said nothing and why say something about Colin Powell but not certain other progressive leaders like Mike Gravel? I guess I don't believe that people uh, should be defined by uh, the lowest moment in their lives. I am incredibly glad to be joined today by Representative Ro Khanna. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you for having me back. It's it's a real pleasure, and we appreciate you being one of the few Congress people who are willing to come and talk to progressive media. So kudos to you, and thank you very much for your time. Of course. Thanks for having me. Uh, I want to get right into it. Uh, what people want to know is why it is that it seems that, as Joe Biden mentioned at the town hall last night, when you have 50 uh, Democrats in the Senate, every single one is a president, yet it seems like some people are a little bit more powerful in that presidential role than others. What exactly is the holdup, as you understand it, with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema right now at this point? Well, I mean, I would argue that uh, Senator Sanders has been very influential. He helped uh, with uh, Joe Biden draft the entire bill. These provisions, and they're very popular, child care, uh, the child allowance, universal preschool, vision, dental hearing for seniors. Uh, the challenge is that he got 48 senators and basically 210 House members, and there were uh, holdouts. Now, the House holdouts, I think, would have been fine with the $3.5 trillion, but uh, the two senators are not. The reality is it takes 51 senators. So over the last two months, basically, there's been an effort of what we need to do to get uh, Mansion and Cinema uh, on board. Uh, that has meant uh, compromising uh, some of the spending, uh, but it's also meant pushing back on uh, places where we think that the cuts are uh, are too severe or where, where uh, uh, we think the compromises are too much. So a few weeks ago, the resounding chorus on Twitter, at least, was hashtag hold the line. And a lot of people on the left were excited about the prospect that the House was going to refuse to vote for the fifth, the bipartisan bill, if it, if the reconciliation bill did not go through. Now it seems that what has happened is that the reconciliation bill is being neutered to an extent that will allow progressives to still say that they held the line, but maybe not so meaningfully. There have been some pretty significant cuts, most principally to the environmental provisions of the bill, which, as you know, it's a be-all, end-all, knockdown, drag out for those who want the planet to continue to exist in some recognizable form, and also cuts to certain other programs that were core promises from Joe Biden on the campaign trail, including free public college. So at what point does the idea of holding the line become nothing more than a, a hashtag and a parlor trick? Well, it's still a very, very significant bill. I mean, if you look at things that the progressives have been fighting for, paid family leave, child care, a child allowance, monthly check, a fat preschool, universal preschool, benefits for seniors and vision, dental, hearing, massive investments in solar and, uh, and, and wind. A lot of that is there. I mean, it is a fundamental commitment to a new social contract, things that other Western democracies have had that our country hasn't had. Now, uh, candidly, the climate uh, is concerning. I mean, the, it's not enough to have just the 300 billion of incentives in uh, solar and wind and uh, tax production. And we made it clear to the president when we met with him uh, that we need to have a 50% reduction by 2030 in emissions. And if the clean electricity program is out, then we need alternatives that will meet that goal. And that's ongoing negotiation. So uh, we have not just said, okay, that's out, uh, let's still pass the plan. I, I hear you on, on climate. Uh, but on a lot of the other things, there is a tremendous amount uh, for progressives to celebrate. I mean, these were policies that are, are in there because of progressive mobilization. They would never have been there even in the Obama administration. These policies weren't uh, in the bill. Representative, it feels as though the fact of any progress at all continually gets leveraged as a justification for why the progress that is possible in this moment isn't getting done. And what's frustrating to many progressives is that while, of course, some incremental progress is made, if the reason why a more significant progress isn't going through has nothing to do with the interests of voters, the ability of Congress people to stay elected, because in fact, these are popular programs we're talking about, and has to do with 
corporate corruption, the holdout senators taking closed door meetings, very openly saying they're negotiating with the interest groups that are opposed to climate reform, or in the case of Kirsten Sinema, she's been vocal about her refusal to concede to any um, raise of the corporate tax rate. If these are the obstacles, as opposed to any barrier that has any kind of political resonance uh, in terms of relating to the constituency groups that these people are supposed to be serving, at what point does that it become a sort of cover? Uh, well, at what point are representatives like yourself providing cover for that level of corruption by continuing to point to the fact that, yes, there's incremental progress that's been made? Well, I wouldn't describe it as incremental progress. Uh, I, I don't think Senator Sanders or, or others would as well. I mean, the fact that we could have universal preschool in this country is a, a big deal. It's a, one of the most significant things we could do. They have it in France, and it actually reduces inequality significantly by the time someone gets to first grade. The fact that we're going to have uh, a child care finally covered in this country is a big deal. The fact that we're going to have seniors get dental vision and hearing in some ways is a, is a big deal. So I, I actually think that the bill uh, is uh, significant. I, I genuinely believe that. Now, I'm disappointed with the concept. The fact that community college is being cut is particularly concerning in a, a new economy to, to not give people that that access, and I'm concerned that the climate goals don't go nearly far enough to meet meet the moment. Uh, but but this is not incrementalism. I mean, this is not the politics of the 1980s. But this is this is what we're talking about. The original plan to expand Medicare to provide hearing, visual, vision, and dental, incredibly important. But what we're now talking about is a voucher, correct, that will cover a small fraction of dental surgeries. People are flocked to the internet to give testimonials of how they pay $2,000 out of pocket to replace a crown. And we're talking about, what, a $500, $700 voucher to cover a portion of that cost. So when we still talk about the, the benefits as broad coverage the way they were initially designed, even though now they are piecemeal and a mere fraction of what was ultimately promised, aren't you concerned that that feels like a bait and switch and that you're over-promising in a way that voters aren't going to actually feel when they actually start getting the benefit of these programs? And isn't the point that voters feel the benefit of these programs to to such a degree that it ends up helping Democrats in what's going to be a very difficult midterm season? Fair questions. I mean, on the, the Medicare vision, dental, and hearing, that has not been finalized. I mean, that's a point of negotiation where progressives are pushing for those benefits to be as generous as possible. Now, the voucher, as long as it's not a palliative, as long as it's every American, partly uh, that was Senator Sanders' his, his idea, because otherwise CMS uh, is going to take for five, six years to actually certify the dentist to have uh, it covered. So we said that's way too long. What can we do in the immediate? And if we, the idea was to do a thousand dollar voucher to every American on, on Medicare. But I agree with you that uh, right now maybe that gets uh, cut and is a, as broad. And we ought to really we have to fight to make sure it is a voucher that's universal. That would make a difference. It's not going to be as good as coverage. But CMS is holding up coverage till almost twenty twenty eight. So uh, in the interim, in the short term, we have to do something. And hearing and, and vision, we have to make sure that that's part of Medicare. Uh, and not some program outside of Medicare. And that's a continued negotiation right now with the White House, uh, Senator Sanders and and, and progressives. So uh, you're right that that has to be a push and we're still pushing for a a robust commitment to to those three benefits. I guess the central problem that people are struggling struggling with is this lack of transparency. I mean, you recently told uh, Chris Cuomo in an interview that you weren't, it wasn't disclosed to you what Kristen Sinema's demands were, that you weren't privy to what it was that would actually move her. And this is the question that people have been turning over and over again. What is it that is being leveraged by the White House to push Cinema Mansion or any of the others who aren't as vocal, but have reported to be behind the scenes, also not on board um, with all parts of this Biden agenda? What, what levers are being used to try to influence either Mansion, Cinema, or others to get on board with this program? Well, first, we have to make the point that it's hard to enact transformative change, though we are going to come close to doing so, and I hope we will prevail with a 50-50 Senate and a three-seat majority of the House, right? It's Historically, that's almost never happened. Usually with Johnson or the New Deal or even Obama had 
much bigger numbers, which means that we have still work to do. We've got uh, people elected, but we need more progressives in the House. We need more progressives in the Senate. That said, yes, but right now, these are the cards with Manchin and Cinema. You know, I've been pretty blunt. I've called out Cinema on CNN and on MSNBC, and so so has Richie Torres, so has Katie Porter. You know, we haven't held punches. I mean, if anything, uh, I've probably gone overboard in uh, in saying that she's not being transparent, she's not giving interviews, she's erratic, and she voted uh, against the Trump tax cuts and now isn't willing to repeal them. So it's not for a lack of, of calling her out. Manchin has been transparent. I mean, it, it's the challenges that his ideology is different than ours, and we have to figure out how to convince him. What I have proposed is have the benefit of these new jobs in West Virginia so that you, we say 100,000 guaranteed new clean tech jobs in West Virginia or places like that to try to get him on board. But cinema has has really been an enigma. And look, the left, is, people are even talking about primarying her openly. Uh, I do think there's a lot of uh, every effort is being made uh, to, to get her on board. And some people are saying, OK, if we can get Manchin, then and cinema is the lone holdout, just push a vote and and dare her to vote against the entire agenda. Well, when you say Manchin is ideologically disinclined, what specifically are you referring to? The coal interest in his state or something in addition to that? Well, he has been pretty clear that he is not for more than $1.5 trillion for months, right? I mean, he, he had that memo to Senator, Senator Schumer back in July. I'm not I saying bet, I, But that statement is not an ideological statement. That's a conclusory one. So when you say that you think that Joe Manchin... Because what, what I'm trying to get at is people make declarative statements about what they will and will not do. And the presumption is that politics is the game of convincing people that whatever their priorities are should shift because you can give them something that they want in the alternative. Part of the frustration with both Manchin and Cinema is that the objections that they've made have been either unprincipled or nonsensical. Random gestures to not wanting to cause inflation or pretty uh, explicit you know, resistance to the kind of climate reforms which he perceives to hurt the interest of the coal economy. Or Kirsten Cinema's open being openly lobbied by corporate interests who don't want a, to- a corporate tax hike, right? But I don't hear as much calling out, as you put it, on those particular grounds in a way that reveals the inanity of the excuses being put forward by either of those senators? Well, I think with Cinema, there have been, uh, she has been called out very explicitly for uh, eroticism, for the influence uh, that uh, her unwillingness to raise taxes at all and wondering why that is when she voted against the Trump tax cuts for not being transparent. Uh, I, I, you mentioned, I guess, differently. I mean, obviously, I disagree with him, but he's in a state that Donald Trump carried by 40%. And so, uh, that the the challenge with him, and usually he comes around and votes for the Democratic bill. Uh, and in this case, our challenge is to make sure that robust climate provisions are in the bill, and that's an ongoing negotiation. And uh, I believe we can get there uh, if we can convince uh, people like him that the jobs are going to be in his state. Uh, but you know, I, I I view that as a different case than cinema where cinema is in a state that Joe Biden carried uh, and that Mark Kelly, the other senator, is totally on board with and, 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 is, and is still putting these roadblocks. So this point came up in a recent interview you did with Jordan Charrington on Status Coup, which people should check out. Status Coup does amazing work. And you know, Jordan pushed back and pointed out that this is West Virginia, West Virginia is also a state that Bernie Sanders won in every county uh, in 2016, I believe, vote for vote, Bernie Sanders was able to secure more votes. Obviously, it's a presidential election. It's a different context than Joe Manchin. And until fairly recent history, West Virginia was, in fact, a blue state. So moreover, as you've pointed out, a plurality of the policies that are being advanced within this Build Back Better agenda are very popular with people in his home state. So why continue to frame this as a referendum on Joe Manchin's electability, as opposed to the gap between what Joe Manchin is standing for and what the people of West Virginia actually want. Well, Sanders, uh, and I love uh, Sanders, you know, he was a co-chair for his campaign. He won the primary there, but, uh, you know, the general election in a, in a state like West Virginia is, is a different, is a different uh, uh, issue. Now, I think it's fair to say that the policies that this bill have 
are supported by the majority of West Virginians, uh, including in a general election, not just in a primary. And that's uh, an argument that uh, people have made, that, that, that these are uh, uh, supported uh, uh, across the board. But ultimately, the question is, how do you get uh, a Senator Manchin to, to a yes? And most people uh, figure uh, that they need something that they can take back and uh, go to their state and say, this is a win. I believe the way to get into a yes is to show that this is really going to create a lot of jobs and opportunity in his state. And, and that's what some of us are working on to, 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 to convince him of that. All, the alternative is that, uh, you know, he can he can walk away, I, I, which I don't think he will. What do you mean by walk away from the bill or from the Democratic Party, as some have suggested this past week? I don't think he would do it from the party itself, but he could certainly from the bill. I mean, he said as much uh, if, uh, you know, if, if we aren't uh, making the case uh, in, in a way that uh, is, is compelling. And so I guess it's just a question of, uh, you know, he he has not kept his cards uh, hidden as, as cinema as he's been pretty upfront. Now, I obviously progressive disagree on a, a number of issues with him. But we believe our agenda is popular across the country, including West Virginia. But the question is, how do we now get him on board to come uh, see that perspective as opposed to uh, and not being for the bill, and then we don't have any of these policies that we want. And so we've tried to take an approach of convincing him, as has Senator Sanders. I mean, he sat down with him three, four times. They've had spirited conversations. Uh, he hasn't compromised his beliefs, but he's trying to see where can we find common ground. His beliefs being what? See, th- this is this is the problem again. What do those conversations look like? People want to know what he's being offered, right, in the course of those conversations. Because if the issue is he's worried that West Virginia will lose jobs and a a Green New Deal job style program is being proposed that would mitigate those concerns, well, then you would expect him to turn around without any issue. But if you believe differently that his interests aren't what he's representing them to be, then it doesn't, it's not as easy as satisfying the political issue at hand, right? Well, and I, I think, think that there's- two different things. Mm-hmm. One is that in traditionally, certain states have not benefited from the promises that politicians have made about jobs or green jobs. I mean, they think, okay, those jobs are gonna to go to California, Rose District or other places, but are they really gonna help our family and our communities? And, you know, they say, okay, there's just transition or, you know, retraining is politicians speak, but we haven't really seen it. All we've seen is deindustrialization and uh, mines closed and communities left behind. So there's a trust deficit uh, that has nothing to do with mansion, but th- that if you go as you have to these communities, you you hear. And so I think we have to be more affirmative. I think we talk, talk to talk about a jobs guarantee in places like West Virginia, 100,000 jobs guaranteed in these communities. Uh, and, and that ought to be explicit as opposed to sort of these broad policies and thinking, OK, that'll work itself out. And that is the type of proposal that some of us are uh, are, are taking to, to Senator Manchin. Then there's the philosophical issue, which is the debate between those who believe, like me and Senator Sanders and other progressives, that the state needs to have a role in supporting education and health care, and that we ought to have Medicare for all, and that we ought to have a universal preschool up through college, and that that's something that the state has a responsibility to do. Uh, and those who don't believe that the state should have that big of a role and believe that the state should have a smaller role and they they don't want the state to play a role as significant a role. And, and Manchin is in the in the corner where he doesn't believe the state should have that big a role. I mean, and that has a, been an ongoing debate in, uh, in in American politics, which the progressives are winning, uh, but, but we still don't have it, the numbers sufficiently uh, in, in the Senate and in the House. Right. So. This is the issue, though, Representative, and I think I think you know you know this that when Barack Obama has sixty votes, magically the sixtieth turns out to be the obstacle to the biggest piece of legislation he's trying to put through to to Obamacare, right, Joe Lieberman. Right. When when Democrats have fifty votes, uh, of course someone appears to foil the plot. And it's a lot easier to sell that it's out of our control when the mar- margins are so slim. But recent history has shown us that even when we have super majorities, that's not enough when it comes to Democrats. Moreover, you see Joe Biden failing to do any number of things 
that actually he could do solo by executive order, some of which were campaign promises. So you had in that leaked call last fall, Sherlyn Eiffel imploring Joe Biden in front of a number of prominent civil rights leaders to enact aspects of the George Floyd Act, Justice Act, which he declined to do, said he was going to decline to do in the course of that call, and then later declined to do, blowing past the deadline that he set for himself by passing it by the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. You have Joe Biden continuing to pretend that he doesn't have the authority to cancel student debt, even though he cancels small piecemeal trickles of it here and there are using the exact same authority um, that would be required to do it all, even though the postponement on loans is done in the same authority that it would take to cancel. You have uh, marijuana decriminalization and all these other aspects, the HBCU funding, which has, you know, gotten slashed from this, these, these reconciliation bills, these um, infrastructure bills, and on and on and on and on. So at a certain point, it stops feeling like there's genuine obstacles to this and starts feeling like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are the convenient rotating villain of the story, as there always is, and Joe Biden's reluctance to do any of the things that he could, could do or meaningfully engage in filibuster form reform really show his true hand. What do you say to people who are coming to this with that level of skepticism? Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.